with our children, you know, for forever. Um, but I don't know. You know, it says that Jesus will wipe away every tear, which implies that at the beginning, there's going to be tears that he's wiping away. Yeah. And so, But I believe that there's that total healing transformation thing. So, again, pain is death. Tragedies are death. So once you wipe all that stuff away, I don't know if we'll still remember some aspects of it, but with the death removed. Um, to where it's kind of like, oh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Now I only remember the good stuff. I only remember the testimony part of it. I don't remember the pain, the fear, the loss, all that stuff. So I don't know exactly how it's going to be. I, I don't believe that we're just going to be like, um, just, it'll be us. That used to be one of my fears. Will it be me who goes to heaven? Or by the time I get there, will I forget everything that makes me unique? We'll just be, well, this is the shell of what used to be called Daniel, but now it's Christ and Daniel only. And now it's just this new thing. And no, it will be you that actually gets to go because that was my fear i'm like god will i even get to go yeah yeah are you going to destroy everything inside of no and that's a totally different topic maybe we'll get to another time but he's going to destroy all the lies that are inside of you but your true identity has been hidden and safe in him all along and so you're going to discover more parts of you you didn't know were you and again i don't know how much of that will play into memories i don't so i don't know i, I it's it um it's a great question i can wait to find out <laughs> i'm not in a hurry but i'm also looking forward to finding out right um so i don't believe that we're going to be like a brain wipe you know men in black poof, like I, I, what's, forget what, everything what's my name right about? um and oh do have i met you before you know i don't think it'll be like that yeah um and maybe one bit of evidence to this again the mount of transfiguration elijah and moses were talking with jesus so that's after they had died and gone to heaven and then I get, you know, Old Testament may, may have been a bit different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but they still had things to talk about Jesus. They weren't just memory wiped. They had something like, I mean, they're probably talking with him about things that they had seen glimpses of, promises that hadn't been fulfilled yet. Now they're talking to him because it has been fulfilled um, or is in the process of being fulfilled. So good question. I have the same question. Um, I, I, I know enough of the answer to feel very comfortable and excited about the answer. I just don't know. Um, 100% what that'll be like. You know, I think sometimes uh, here on earth when we have an experience that um, hurts us deeply, uh, that's how you can kind of tell when you're healed from it, right? Is you, you almost feel disconnected from it right. that because me. it doesn't affect me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's more of a glimpse, like you say, right. of those experiences. But even with the happy times, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, to again... You you asked for it, so this is a bit, um, take us with a grain of salt. You asked for it. <laughs> but anything, that's, anything that's not of faith is sin. So it could even be that anything that we do in this life of faith yeah. lasts forever because those are things that are life, those flowed from our right, spirit. Right. So anything that we do from life will last. Anything that we do out of fear, out of our natural flesh, all that stuff may, may be the stuff that gets wiped away. So it's kind of like, right. you know, I've, I've wondered before, I'm like, somebody who walks in the spirit a lot in mm -hmm. this lifetime, they get to heaven and they're like 20 years old and lots of people who are 80 years old but only walked in the spirit about five minutes yeah. they get to heaven as <laughs> babies again that's all crazy talk but um but again i'm just wondering is if it flowed from our spirit maybe that'll last because that wasn't death but if it right. didn't flow from our spirit it's sin which is death and that won't last the and wood so, hay and stubble anything you did burnt. yeah it burnt right. up disappeared and uh good point Ma, and so uh, yeah geez. all the gems pressure anything that we did that was gold and jewels and all these wonderful right. things those things do last into eternity so if that if that carries over into our memories um that'd be cool that yeah. might be one I, I can't say definitely for sure but it seems to be something along those lines yeah praise god okay so well we're way over time <laughs> i don't know that was my <laughs> I, I don't know was his answer yeah. no that was awesome daniel thank you so much that was thank amazing you. Yeah. and you guys thank you for uh writing in these questions hopefully maybe next time daniel comes back uh we can touch on the subject again and get to more yeah. of these questions i'll, I'll look through some of the ones i didn't get to and see if I can weave them into... Yeah, exactly. That'd be awesome. Uh, maybe answer some of these questions that you guys submitted <laughs> in his next teaching on it. So that was really good. So thank you guys. You have an awesome weekend. Uh, make sure if you need prayer for anything right now, please don't hesitate to give our prayer ministers a call at 719-635-1111. Also, don't forget, Monday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, we have daily live Bible study again. So have a blessed weekend. Uh, be safe. You are protected by the supernatural power of God. And um, thanks, Daniel. Hopefully yeah, thank we'll see you, you again soon.
Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, have a good one. Yeah, hope. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Just play it. All right. Yeah. Everybody have a good weekend. See ya. Yeah, bye. Welcome to AWM Now, a small glimpse on how Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College are raising up leaders who are changing the world, leaders like Mackenzie Schutz. While on his Karis mission trip to Uganda, Mackenzie fell in love with the local people and desired a way to improve their lives. Unsure if he should go the route of missions or business, Mackenzie returned to the country by himself in search of an answer. The people that I met were absolutely remarkable. I knew that I was where I was exactly where I was supposed to be. It was on that trip that I knew that it was not either or business or mission work and ministry work, but really it should be both. And then I, I had a business plan was, was born. The company is called Eagle and Crane Coffee Company. The Eagle represents the United States and the Crane is for Uganda. It really represents all of us coming together and making the world just a little bit better. And if we can do that with coffee, that's what we're going to do. Through Eagle and Crane, McKinsey has not only given several Ugandan farmers a chance to come out of poverty, his company also provides a mentorship program that teaches local youth on how they can produce a crop worth two years' wages. Karis certainly changed my life. To learn what I did at Karis Bible College is life-changing. At the time, when I started the company, it was a big leap, but that's what the Christian life really is, and I don't think I would have done that <laughs> if I didn't learn how to, how to practice that while I was at Andrew's school. Thank you, friends and partners, for providing a place where people like McKinsey can discover the unique call on their life and change the world one delicious cup of coffee at a time. To learn more about Eagle and Crane Coffee Company, click on the link below. A little girl grows back a missing piece of her heart. A drug dealer becomes an evangelist. A family buried under $60,000 in debt creates a business worth millions. These breakthroughs did not happen to seasoned ministers or Bible scholars, but to people who simply believed God's promises in the midst of the impossible. For 20 years, Andrew has faithfully taught the Word of God on television. As a result, we have been overwhelmed with reports of the miraculous, cancers defeated, debts demolished, autism overcome, destinies fulfilled, marriages restored, addictions broken, and healings of every kind. Our video testimony collection contains over 60 powerful stories demonstrating how anyone can access God's promises for themselves. For this reason, Andrew has made all of these stories available to you free of charge. To gain instant access to this wealth of inspiration, simply visit awmi.net, click on the Watch tab, and select Video Stories from the drop-down menu. We invite you to copy the link to each of our stories and share it as many times as you wish. Invest in yourself in a world desperate for life-changing good news. my refuge and my strength, a present help in time of need. He is my fortress, my deliverer, my father, my friend indeed. God, you're my refuge and my strength, a present help in time of my fortress, my deliverer, my father, my friend indeed. Lord, you're my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me to lie down in peace. You lead me beside the still waters of soul is restored at your feet. 
God, you're my refuge and my strength, a present help. my deliverer, my father, my friend indeed. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will not fear any harm. Thy rod and thy staff, they come. God, you're my refuge and my strength, a present help in time of need. You are my fortress, my deliverer, my father, my friend, indeed. Yes, you're my father, my friend. My name is Rick Renner, and this is September 18th, and our gym today is called, What Are You Doing With Your Time? And our scripture is Ephesians 5, verse 16, where the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Think about how much time you waste. The day passes, and you've wasted so much time. Or maybe you've had events in your life that you feel like stole some time from you. Well, you don't have to regret that. The Bible says you can redeem the time. The word redeem is a Greek word, ex agorizo. It means to buy back, to take back again. And now we find in this verse that because of the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, if we'll be wise, we'll learn how to redeem the time or to take back what the enemy stole from us. We don't have to lose it permanently. We can redeem the time. We can buy it back. We can take it back, and if we'll listen to the Lord and be dedicated and thoughtful, he'll show us how to take that lost time back and to make up for what we previously lost. That's what the Bible promises us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16. And that's what I want you to think about today. Gospel Truth TV Business is how you can receive the godly advice to grow your business and leadership potential. Tune in Saturdays from 9 to noon Eastern to hear Andrew's friends share the kingdom principles that have helped them succeed. You can produce death with your words or you can produce life with your words. When you go into something like that and commit to be a finisher, you will see success. Learn proven business principles every Saturday from 9 to noon Eastern on Gospel Truth TV Business. You're watching Gospel Truth TV, teaching God's unconditional love and grace. Would you please welcome to the stage Andrew Womack, our founder and president. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Man, it's been a great morning. Greg and Rick were just awesome. Praise God. Man, I hope you've gotten a lot of good things out of this so far. You know, we've got a lot of students that were that are here this morning that weren't here last night. And last night we received an offering, and I am going to receive an offering this morning and give you an opportunity. I know that we got a lot of givers among our students, and man, they just don't want to miss out on something God's doing. So if we could get our ushers uh, to pass out the envelopes, we are going to give you an opportunity to sow. And uh, let me just share with you from 2 
uh, Corinthians chapter 9. I use this a lot, but I, the Lord speaks to me a lot about this. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I was in the wrong Corinthians. And in verse 10, it says, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. You know, God says he would give seed to sowers. I often say it this way, that if you're short of seed, it's because God doesn't see you as a sower. He said he gives seeds to sower. In other words, this isn't really talking about just planting seed in the ground. It's using that as an example of money. He gives money to people who will give. And if you're short of money, it's because God doesn't see you as a giver. If you are a giver, if he can get his money through you, then he'll get it to you. So if you're short of finances, it's because you haven't been really giving. And this is counterintuitive. In the natural, it looks like that, Lord, I already have more needs than I've got money. I'm already short. If I take a portion of what I got and give it away, well, then I'm going to have even less. And did you know in the natural, that is absolutely true. But it's not true in the supernatural. If there was no God... And if he hadn't made a promise that when you give, it will be given back unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Well, then it's true that taking a portion of what you've got and giving it away moves you away from your goals. But because there is a God who has promised that he will multiply whatever you sow back to you, then actually giving is a way to receive increase. It's against everything in the natural, and that's exactly the reason I believe that God set it up that we give. If you weren't here last night, I was teaching from uh, 1 Kings chapter 17 about the widow at Zarephath, and Elijah said, give to me first. He wasn't taking from that woman. He was giving to her. He was getting her to take a step of faith, and when you do that, it just releases something supernatural. This says that God gives seed to sowers. Everybody could be divided into one of two categories, either givers or takers, sowers or hoarders. And, you know, everybody who gives also has to receive. This isn't saying that you don't learn how to receive and that you don't, God doesn't bless you. But there are people that their heart is all about. They're always praying about, God, give me more. And it's always about themselves. If you hear somebody's testimony about how God supplied for them, there's some people that just immediately think, I wish God had done that for me. Why doesn't he do that for me? How do I get God to do for me what he did for them? That's a hoarder. But when a person who's a giver hears about somebody giving and doing something, man, it just blesses them. They love to give. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I'm telling you, you've got to develop this heart attitude. It doesn't come natural. This isn't natural for you to think about just blessing other people. That is a godly trait. It is against our human nature. You know, Rick was talking about it's not wrong to have fear. It's just wrong to let fear stop you from doing what you're doing. It's not wrong in the natural to look and say, well, God, I'm already short and I, this isn't enough. That's not wrong to recognize that, but it's wrong to let that stop you from doing what God said. You've got to step out in faith and you've got to give. And so... We're giving you an opportunity today. It, notice it says that he gives seed to the sower and then he uh, bread to the eater and then he will multiply your seed song. When you give with the right attitude, God blesses you and you actually wind up having more than you had before. Some people say, well, if I had extra, I would give. You're missing the whole point. <laughs> You're missing the whole point. You know, if what you've got isn't enough for your need, turn it into a seed and plant it. And it'll grow and it'll multiply and then you will have extra. So as we give today, I'm just praying that you would 
Uh, give with this hard attitude and praise God. I believe it'll come back to you. Father, we love you and thank you for all of these promises. Thank you for the way that you set up the kingdom. And Father, for those who desire to give today, I just believe that, Father, you see their heart and that you multiply this back. For those who are sowers, I stand on this promise that you give seed to sowers that you are going to multiply their seed sown, that you will give them bread to eat and that they will never be without. And so, Father, we thank you. We agree and we receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. Amen. So while they're taking up the offering, let's turn over to Second Peter chapter 1. And these are verses that the Lord spoke to me. I bet you it's been close to 50 years ago. And this just provided me with like a track to run on a course for the rest of my life. You know, I remember one time right after I first got turned on to the Lord. It's been 51 years ago last month that the Lord touched my life. And man, I started a journey with him and... Uh, for about four months or four and a half months, I was just so excited about the Lord. I was running on emotion and, um, it was good, but the emotion wore off. And you know, this is something that I, most people don't understand. They are looking for some kind of an experience where they just can feel the presence of the Lord to where they always have this emotion. And, you know, praise God for emotions. God gave us emotions. There's nothing wrong with them. And so there's nothing wrong with feeling the presence of the Lord and having great times with the Lord. You know, during praise and worship this morning, I thought it was just awesome. And the way that, man, they were singing from their heart and there were prophecies that came forth. And uh, we were singing that song about, you know, in your presence and this is what we're after. And so we love the presence of the Lord and all of that's great. But did you know you are not going to feel the Lord like that all of the time? Matter of fact, just last week I read um, an email that was sent to me. And I won't mention the name of the person, but it's a person that most of you in here would know. And it's a worship leader. And he just came out and admitted he had had a nervous breakdown and he had been fighting depression and his life was all messed up. And now he's back on top and he's telling everybody about how good the Lord is. And so that's good. I'm not critical of it. But when I saw that, I thought, you know, this is common for people, especially, I think, worship people. Because they are looking for some kind of a connection where you not only know according to the scripture that God is with you, but that you can feel it. You can have a manifest presence of the Lord. And they're looking for that. And when you tap into that, if you aren't careful, you will become addicted to always feeling the presence of the Lord. And there is a difference. When we have a corporate thing here, and man, the music is great, and we got these great singers and stuff, you can tap in to the presence of the Lord in a way that sometimes you don't when you're by yourself. And if you aren't careful, you'll get to a place where you hit these highs. And then if you don't feel anything, you don't think God's with you. And you actually move away from faith and away from fact. And you just get into where you're operating your whole life by feeling. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I bet you most of the people in here have never thought this way. And you say, well, no, this is what I'm after. I want to live like this 24 hours a day. God doesn't even want you living like that 24 hours a day. I ain't, I'm not, this is on the way to where I'm going. So I'm not going to camp here the whole time. But see, I had this experience where I was caught up in the presence of God for four and a half months. And I mean, God was just awesome. But it wore off. And there's reasons. I could tell you, I don't understand everything about it, but I can tell you, for one thing, there was a Baptist pastor that followed me all over Europe for three weeks and told me I was of the devil and that everything I'd experienced was of the devil. And he got me into doubt and uh, fighting things. And there's multiple things that happened, but I don't understand all of the reasons, but I do know the Lord has told me since then that he doesn't want you to live 
on just an emotional level. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. When feelings come, when you have a service where everybody's just caught up in the presence of God and loving God, well, that's awesome. Enjoy it. But recognize that the vast majority of time, you aren't going to just be feeling goosebumps going up and down your spine. You aren't going to have flashes of light and it's not going to be overwhelming. And you are going to spend the vast majority of your time walking by faith because that's what God desires. If God wanted to, he could have a bird come and sit on every one of our shoulders and tell us every day, I love you. And we could have something special happen. He could write your name in every cloud. He could have something supernatural happen to you every moment of every day. He could have a dog come up and say, God loves you. He spoke through Balaam's donkey. God could do all of those things, but the Lord delights in doing things in subtle ways that take faith. Think about this. When Jesus came, he could have arrived on a 747 and landed that out in front of the uh, Herod's palace, you know, in Jerusalem. Or he could have come in a helicopter. I guarantee you God could have done those things. Or he could have done all of these other things. After Jesus rose from the dead, every single person in Jerusalem was aware of his crucifixion. And it, I mean, it was the big thing. All he would have had to have done is just hover over Jerusalem and let everybody see him raised from the dead. And millions of people would have hit their knees. They'd have been forced to. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus never appeared to a single person who wasn't already a believer after his resurrection. If it would have been me, I'd have appeared to Herod first. <laughs> or maybe Pilate. I'd have shook his bed and I said, are your hands clean now, Pilate? I'd have gone to those soldiers who blindfolded him and spit in his face and slapped him and said, if you're the Christ, prophesy. I'd have gone to them and I said, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, just like what Greg was talking about, how that he read the mail of this couple and stuff. And praise God for these gifts of the Spirit. But it's done in a way that it's not a blinding flash of light. You know, people can reject it. God wants you to operate in faith. And so I say all of this on the way to 2 Peter chapter 1 that I had this huge experience, but it didn't last. And I've actually had people come up to me after I've shared something like this. And they said, did you know 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago, something, I had something like that. God touched me and for a while. I was just overwhelmed. But then they lost it. And then they didn't know what to do. See, this is exactly what happened to me. One of the best things that ever happened to me is right after I had this experience with the Lord, while I was still caught up in just the emotion in the presence of God, God spoke to me and told me to quit uh, school. I was in university, and he told me to quit school. And at that time, that was the height of the Vietnam War. Quitting school was an automatic, all-expense-paid trip to Vietnam. And I lost $350 a month from the government because I was being paid from my father's social security uh, if I stayed in school and I lost the respect of every person that I knew. I had every person tell me, you are absolutely crazy. This can't be God. And so it was, it was one of the hardest things I ever did. But man, I was just enjoying the presence of the Lord. So I made that decision. Sure enough, I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And you know, in retrospect, that's one of the best things that ever happened in my life because... I was just caught up in the presence of the Lord. And then I went to Vietnam and guess what? The emotion was gone. The feelings were gone. And I spent months in Vietnam asking God to kill me. Not because of Vietnam, not because of any of that, but because I wanted this feeling back. I wanted this emotion back. God, I want to feel you the way that I did. And I didn't know what I did to cause it to happen. I didn't know what I did to cause it to leave. And I had no clue what to do to get it back. And there's a number of nights in Vietnam that I, I remember one night, man, I was, I was fast. I fasted one time for three days, first time I'd ever fasted. And I didn't know that, you know, there was a difference, different ways of fasting. I didn't fa I didn't have any water. If you go without water for three days, it begins, you, it can kill you. Usually seven days and you're dead. I didn't know any of this and it was 120 degrees and I was sweating like a pig. 
And I mean, I had to crawl to the mess hall. I barely got there. I, I was in bad shape, but I was just doing all of these things like, oh God, please touch me again. I was seeking this emotion. I remember one night that I stayed up all night long and I was a chaplain's assistant and we had built a chapel and I stayed up all night long in this chapel praying. And uh, when I you know, finally came to myself when the light came up, I must have had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, cockroaches that were this big, just crawling all over me. And man, I was bitten all over and I was oblivious to everything. I was just seeking God with everything I knew, trying to get something. And I was desperate. You know what? They have this song, I'm desperate for you. And uh, I've had people misunderstand. I, I agree that we're supposed to love and long for the Lord and be hungry for the Lord. But I was desperate and it was not good. And anyway, I got to a place to where I was an introvert to start with. But I was the chaplain's assistant, and when people came into the chaplain's bunker, I was the one who was supposed to take their names and make appointments and interact with the soldiers and stuff. And I just, I was so desperate. I was saying, oh, God, where are you? God, I need you to touch me. And I wasn't standing on what the Word says, that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. I was wanting something beyond the Word. I don't care what the Word says. I want to feel this. And so I, I believe that the Lord did something unique for me. I'm not saying that this is the way it should be for everybody else. I'm not even saying that this is theologically correct. But did you know I woke up one morning and it's like God was gone. I thought I didn't have any feeling of God or any awareness of his presence. But man, I woke up and I mean fear gripped me. It I honestly believe that that's what hell is going to be like, is there is going to be nothing good. Nothing good. And I mean, there was nothing good in my life, and panic hit me. And for three days, man, I just was, I was fearful. People would come and knock on the chaplain's door, and I remember going in this little place where I slept, and we had a little makeshift closet that I'd made, and I piled uh clothes on top of me and hid under the clothes. I know some of you are going to think, man, you were weird. Well, I was. That's what happens when I, I had experienced such an high from God. I thought I can't live without this. And I was looking for that to be returned. And so God just says, all right, you don't you don't appreciate me just being with you and just the peace and the stuff that, you know, we have. I'll take everything away from you. And he took away from me every, every semblance of peace that I've ever had in my life. And for three days, man, I was miserable. I was, uh, it was bad. I don't have the words to describe to you. You know, I heard Keith Moore say something along these lines. He's the only other person I ever heard say this, but he was uh, wanting to press in and just know the Lord more. And he was always begging, oh God, I need you to touch me. And he wasn't aware of God with him. And so uh, he, he, he fasted and he says, God, whatever it takes, manifest yourself to me and just show me that you're with me. And he was the one that led the um, healing school for Kenneth Hagin. And he ran their healing school. He played the guitar, he sang, and, and he preached. And anyway, he said he got there and he couldn't remember a single chord on the guitar. He couldn't remember a song. He didn't remember what he was supposed to be doing. It's just like he could not function. And he literally had to stop and ask somebody else to come take over the thing. And for three days, he was just, he couldn't survive. His wife thought he had lost his mind. And finally, after three days, the Lord uh, restored everything to him and says, you are wanting to recognize me and see me. He says, you don't realize, but I'm with you. I'm the one that taught you how to play the guitar. I'm the one that gave you the ability to sing. I'm the one that gives you the gift to be able to minister. And all of a sudden, uh, Keith started saying, God, never again will I ever ask you for this. And he just began to appreciate it. Well, that's what happened to me. 
And after three days, uh, I woke up in the morning. I was sleeping on an army cot, and I woke up in the morning kneeling beside my cot, and nothing. And I was praying, and nothing special was happening. There wasn't any lights. There wasn't any bells. There wasn't any emotion. But I was just back to normal. It was like I was no longer fearful, and I realized, God, forgive me, forgive me for doubting you being with me just because I didn't have some awesome manifestation and something special happening. And from that day on, I have never been desperate for experiencing the presence of God. I mean, God taught me a lesson. It was awesome. And the reason I was headed to Second Peter, have you found it yet? <laughs> if you hadn't got it by now, you might as well look on with your neighbor. Amen you aren't going to find it. But the reason I was headed here is because of all of these things that happened to me when I was in Vietnam. Finally, I just said, all right, God, uh, apparently you do not want to give me another experience like I had March the 23rd, 1968. How do I cope? How do I live? And I actually was uh, in, in Vietnam, there was a lot of things going on. There was a lot of sin. You could get all the dope that you wanted. There was ungodliness, profanity. I mean, people couldn't say a sentence without blaspheming God. They would, every three months, they'd bring us back to the rear area and bring in these prostitutes and give you all of the booze that you could drink. They'd get every single person. I'm the only person in my company that did not get drunk and have sex with these prostitutes. And dope, and, and it was just, there was so much temptation pressing on me. One time I stayed in a transient bunker for a while and the whole thing, the ceiling, the walls, everything was wallpapered with nude pictures of women. And I mean, I just, you couldn't do anything without being exposed to sin. And the only way I was able to survive was just like this. I mean, I would read like this and I wouldn't even put my Bible down and think about it. I just, I started reading the Bible out of desperation. Nobody had ever told me anything about the word of God, but I just, I had to do something. So I started reading my Bible and these are some of the verses that God gave me and it just changed my life. Second Peter chapter one, verse one, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained. You know, I didn't get this revelation at this time, but since then I've seen Peter is writing to people who have obtained. In other words, he's not writing to people who want to obtain. If you want to get what I've got, then do these things. No, he's writing to people who have what he has. One of the things that began to happen through all of this, I realized that, man, God was with me all of the time. And there may be some special times where you have, you know, God just... Pull back a curtain and you reveal something. Like Jesus, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he began to radiate light and all of these things began to happen. And they were just shocked. They fell at his feet. They wanted to build three tabernacles. But did you know that Jesus was exactly the same when he went down off of the mountain? He didn't change. It wasn't that all of a sudden Jesus came to a new level. He was like that all of the time. But his body was like a curtain or a veil that kept people from seeing whom he really was. John, at the Last Supper, he had his head resting on Jesus' chest because they reclined at the meal. And there was this intimacy and love between Jesus and his disciples, and there was nothing wrong with that. It was all proper. And he had his head on Jesus' chest. But when he saw him in glory in Revelation chapter 1, and his eyes like faint flames of fire, and his voice was like Niagara Falls, and his feet were like brass that was on fire. When he saw Jesus in his glory, he fell at his feet as dead and had to be quickened. Did you know that was the exact same Jesus that he had his head on his chest? It was just that body was veiling what was inside. But Jesus didn't somehow or another progress to another level. He just lost the robe of this physical flesh and he had his glorified flesh. God is among us all the time. God is here in all of his glory today. You aren't trying to get something new for God. The Christian life is a discovery of what you already have. But like I said in the beginning, God is a God of faith. He delights in doing things that you have to perceive it by faith. Did you know Jesus could manifest a glory cloud in here? He did it in the Old Testament. He could have a flame of fire in here. He did it in the Old Testament. 
But did you know Jesus never had those things happen in his ministry? Some of you may be too young in the Lord to remember back in the 80s and the 90s when people were having glory clouds come in and, and gold fall and get in their Bible. I had a woman come to me one time and she says, look at this. And she had gold flakes in her Bible. And when she showed it to me, I, I went, <laughs> I said, you had something on there. And she just panicked like, oh, you blew the gold away. But there's people that are wanting something other than what God says. And they would throw their Bible down on the ground to go get a, a gold flake. Oh, this proves that God is here. To have some oil on their hands or to feel a goosebump go up and down your spine. Man, you'd throw the Bible in the dirt and forget it if you could just have a goosebump. That's not what God desires. But Peter is writing to people who not want to have something. You're looking for a, something more. He's writing to people that already have the same faith that he had. The same faith that when he walked by, his shadow would touch people and they'd be healed and raised up. The same faith that raised Dorcas from the dead. The same faith that he was able to walk on water and go to Jesus. He's writing to people that have the like precious faith. You already have it. One of the mistakes people make so often is, oh God, just give me more faith. You don't need more faith. The Bible says you have the faith of the Son of God in you. I'm not going to teach on that, but the first teaching I ever made was on the faith of God. Every one of you already have the same quality and quantity of faith that Jesus had. You don't need more faith. You need to find out what you've got and begin to start using what you've got. Peter is writing to people that have like precious faith with him. If you say, well, I don't have the same faith that Peter had, well, then just tear 2 Peter out of your Bible. Because it's written to people that have like precious faith. This only applies to you if you have like precious faith with Peter. You already have like precious faith. And how did you get it? You've obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not because of your fasting, because of your prayer, because of your holiness. When you got born again, you were given the faith of the Son of God. You do not have a faith deficit. You got a knowledge problem. You don't know what you got. We're looking for a feeling. We're looking for some emotion. We're looking for some haze to come in here. Take your glasses off and things will get fuzzy. Amen. <laughs> and then he says in the second verse, he says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. See, again, people, oh, God, just give me peace. God, I'm disturbed. I'm worried. How is this going to work out? And so, God, just give me peace. Peace doesn't come by prayer. Peace comes through knowledge. If you are distressed and worried and stressed out, it's because you don't have the faith. You haven't cast your care over upon the Lord. You don't have a revelation of how much he loves you, etc. If you understood how much God loved you, if you ever really get a revelation, not just intellectual knowledge, but a heartfelt revelation of God and who he is and how much he loves you, I guarantee you fear just goes out the window. Worry and care goes out the window. You don't pray and say, oh God, give me peace. Take away my fear. Take away my anxiousness. Perfect love casts out fear. You've got to understand and get the revelation of God's kind of love. Oh God, give me more faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You've already got the faith of God in your spirit. You just have to draw it out through the knowledge of God. And this is what God began to speak to me when I was in Vietnam. I was saying, oh God, where are you? And I was wanting this feeling. Then I had this experience where I said, uh, you know what? I, I won't press for a feeling anymore. I think I'll just learn how to walk by faith because that nearly did me in. And then he began to speak to me that it all comes through the knowledge of him. And then in the third verse, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. All things, not a lot of things, not some things, not the big things, all things. Anything you need, anything. If you need healing, you've got a knowledge problem. If you need peace, you've got a knowledge problem. If you're lonely, you've got a knowledge problem. You know, I was just here, I think it was Monday, Tuesday or something, and, 
And uh, there was a young girl that was standing somewhere. And I said, how are you? And she says, lonely. And I said, lonely? How can you be lonely when God Almighty is with you? And I just began to preach to her. And anyway, she, she won't say that to me again. <laughs> but anybody who's lonely, you got a knowledge problem. Man, God will never, see, I was in a sense like that saying, oh God, I want a feeling, I want something. And then I went three days without any feelings, without any knowledge of God. And I decided, God, I'll be content with just your normal. Amen. If you feel lonely, you've got a knowledge problem. If you're poor, you've got a knowledge problem. If you have no vision for the future, you've got a knowledge problem. Whatever it is, all things that pertain unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. And then the fourth verse says, whereby this knowledge gave unto us the exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God's knowledge is what gave us these words. Matter of fact, it says right down here in the latter part of this uh, same chapter in verse 19, it says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wish I had time to go into all of this, but without reading all of these verses, Peter begins to start telling the people that, you know, it's getting close to my time to die. I'm not going to be here and I'm writing these things down so that you will have this in remembrance after I'm gone. And I want you to recognize that you, this isn't something we made up. This isn't a fable. This isn't something that was told us. He says, I saw these things. I was with him on the holy mount when he was transfigured. And I heard an audible voice from God out of heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know why he was saying all of this? Was to show them that, look, you can trust what I'm saying. These things are absolutely true. You know, if I was to go into your town and uh, if I announce that we're having a meeting, some people will come. But if I was to come and say, man, I saw a vision. I heard an audible voice. God, an angel came. And I am going to have an angel appear and stand behind me and speak. And if I was to say all those things, you know what? You couldn't handle the people. Man, they would come. They'd turn out because everybody's looking for the spectacular. But you say, I'm coming to share the word of God. It's like some people, oh, another, another preacher. And you just stay home because you'd miss your favorite show. American idolatry. So the reason he's saying this is to say that, look, you can trust what I'm saying. But then he says down here in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. What could be more sure than seeing the glory of God and hearing an audible voice from God? What, what could be better than that? And he says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, this wasn't men writing about God. This was God revealing himself to through man. It says uh, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. W.E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of the New Testament, he took all of these words and he says that these men were moved like water or a tsunami or something, carrying them along. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, supernaturally, divinely inspired. The Word of God is given to us to reveal God to us, to base our life on it. This is how faith comes, is through the Word of God. And God wants you to walk by faith. And I'm telling you, you can't get there outside of the Word of God. You go to any person in the Bible that God used. Not everybody had a full Bible like what we had, but Abraham, he had a word from God. God appeared to him and he says, count the stars in the sky, number the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall thy seed be. And Romans chapter 4 verse 18 says, be not weak in faith. He looked at these things and uh, with, well, I messed that up. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father 
of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He based his whole life on the word that God gave him. He only had five words. We've got millions of words. But he based his whole relationship with God on what God had spoken to him. It was the word. And I guarantee you there was times that Abraham didn't feel the presence of God. But he just kept standing on this word and standing on this word and standing on the word. And it worked. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is, this is what God is wanting you to bring you to, is to a, a place to where when special times come, enjoy them. But don't get to where if you aren't having God just overwhelm you with some feeling or emotion, you doubt that he's with you. You know, this may not be a real good comparison. I hope you aren't offended by this. But it's kind of like marriage. And you know, in marriage, you have a sexual relationship and, and it is awesome. But you know what? You can't live on that level. And this is one reason that marriages are falling apart. Because today, people don't know how to know they're made any other way than just sexually. It's all sexual. You know, I helped start the pregnancy center in Colorado Springs. And, and for a while I was on the board and they would have me speak when they would get together these conventions. And anyway, I spoke at one of their conventions, had thousands of people there. And this one woman got up who was a clinical psychologist. I don't even know if she was born again. But she was talking about the sexual problem that we have in our society today. And the way she approached it was to, she listed five steps of relationship and I forget now what they all were but I mean it just started you know like boys when you're little kids we thought girls we used to say had cooties you didn't want to be around girls you didn't like girls it's like girls Ugh. and then you all of a sudden I kind of like girls amen and and just being in the presence of a girl was okay and then it just to hold hands or something that was exciting and and she listed all of these different stages. But in our culture, you just go out and on the first date, you have sex. And you, I mean, it is all about sex. And she was explaining that people don't know how to have a relationship outside of just a sexual relationship. They don't know how to talk to a person. They don't know how to be friends. And because of this, this is the reason that a lot of marriages are breaking down. And in a sense, it, there's a comparison here with God. That yes, I've been caught up into the presence of God. I have had God reveal himself to me. I've experienced some awesome things. But you know what? That's not going to be the majority of the time. You read about people in the Bible and we, you know, it's one verse right after the other. And we tend to put all these things together. But like with Elijah, I was using him last night. God spoke to him in 1 Kings chapter 17, told him to go to speak to Ahab, he did it. And then the Lord told him to go uh, to the brook Cherith. He did that. And then the Lord told him to go to the widow of Zarephath. And then in the 18th chapter, three years later, three years later, the Lord says, now go show yourself to Ahab. Three years. Now, we don't know what happened in between that, but it, scripturally, there was a vacancy there for three years. He wasn't getting a word from God every day. Some people, they want to have a, a time with the Lord where they pray and that they hear angels sing and lights flash and, and just feelings and all of these things. And if God was to indulge you and give you what you want, then the next day, you would think it has to be better today. I have to have something more today. And pretty soon, God would just have to be jumping through a new hoop, doing something even bigger, and you, you'd be insatiable. It's like a drug addiction. What do you have to do to have God show you that he loves you? Isn't the word enough? Isn't the fact that Jesus died for you enough? You've got to have something besides that. If God was to give you the desires that you want, you'd just become a feeling junkie. And this is where so many people are. And like I was saying about that praise and worship leader, I can understand praise and worship, man, is powerful. It is one of the most awesome things that God has given us. And corporate worship is wonderful. 
And it's great when you feel the presence of the Lord. There is a manifest presence of God. But did you know if you aren't careful, you'll become addicted to that and you'll try and live that way. And I guarantee you, you aren't going to experience God like that. Forgive me for being blunt. I hope you don't get offended. But in a sense, it's like a person who just has to have an orgasm every day. And spiritually speaking, there's people that just have to have something special every day. That's not the way that God is. Again, if God was like that, he could just be doing things to you all of the time. There's so all of these things happening. That is not the nature of God. The vast majority of time, you are going to be walking with God by faith. And you're just going to have to, you're going to have to hear that still small voice and you're going to have to stand on the word of God. And the reason I got on this was to say that this is what Karis Bible College is all about. You know, this ought not to even have to be said, but sad to say it does. We've had people come to our Bible college who've been through cemetery, I mean seminary, (laughs) and they've spent four years in seminary. And never one time opened the Bible. They would read books about the Bible and they would study all of these things. This is a Bible college. It's nearly, I think that there's a few of our classes that they may use something besides the Bible, but the Bible is the dominant thing. You are going to be having the word opened up unto you. You're going to learn how to walk in faith. You know, in my class alone, first year, we make you read the entire Bible. It's, and if you don't do it, you, you lose 20% on your grade. If you made 100 on everything but didn't read your Bible readings, the best you could do is 80. And we've had people complain every time. Well, this is hard on me. I have dyslexia and I have trouble reading. And, and they come up with the lamest excuses. <laughs> But you know what? To me, it's just wrong to go to a Bible college and have never read the Bible. So in the first year, you have to read the Bible. Just seems logical to me. Amen. Even the the begats. Scripture says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so one of the things we do, we just help you to get into the word and we transition you from where you live by feeling, which again, I am not against feeling. Believe it or not, I do have feelings. (laughs) My staff actually made up one of these pictures of data from the Star Trek thing and they put my face on his body (laughs) and they called me Android Womack. And they make fun about me about that I don't have any emotions. I really do. I tear up at 101 Dalmatians when Corella DeVille is going to kill all of us. I'm a, I'm a sensitive guy, amen. I have emotions, believe it or not, but I just don't, I don't live by emotions. I don't let it control my life. I'll stand up and share the word of God. I don't care whether I feel like it or not. And I've learned over the years that some of the greatest miracles I have ever seen in my life is when I felt nothing. I'm just standing on the word of God. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And I've learned how to act on the word of God regardless of what I feel like. Now, I don't ignore feelings. And if, say, for instance, I started feeling depressed or fearful or discouraged, I'm aware that feelings follow your focus. If you're focused on bad things, you're going to be depressed. And so if I have feelings of depression come, I don't ignore them, but I don't act on them and I don't give in to them and I don't embrace it and I don't confess that I'm depressed. But what I'll do is begin to say, you know what? I haven't been focused on the Lord the way I should because when you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. So anytime I begin to feel depression, anytime I begin to feel fear, anytime I begin to be angry or bitter or any of these things, I recognize that feelings are a factor And they're an indication of where your heart is. And so I'll get my heart back focused on the Lord. So I do not ignore feelings. I just don't indulge feelings and I don't let them dominate me. And I tell you, it's worked well for me. I would recommend it. 
Over in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 19, it says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all manner of uncleanness and all of these things. What does that mean, your past feeling? In other words, there is a right use of feeling. God gave us emotions and there is a right use of them. But you can go way past what the right use is to where you're into lasciviousness. Lasciviousness means uncontrolled, unbridled, unrestrained lust and desire. And that is where our culture is. I've actually had people come to me. I had one of our Bible college students one time give me a tape that they were talking about forgiveness. And the overall point of it was very good. But they used an illustration about that there was a girl who was about 19 years old. And uh, she came to this woman for prayer. And she had unforgiveness towards her parents. And this woman said, I knew the parents. And they were godly people. And they loved this girl. They weren't perfect people. They probably had done something wrong. But they loved this girl. And this girl felt that they hated her and that they had oppressed her because they made her go to uh, church or something like that. And anyway, she just hated them. And this woman said on this tape, she says, I knew that what she was feeling wasn't real. I knew it was wrong. It was a wrong perception. But then she says, it didn't matter whether it was real or not because to her it was real. And man, when I heard that, I pulled that cassette tape out, broke it into pieces, threw it out the window. Man, it made me mad because this is where so many people live. I, you know, nobody loves me. When I was a little kid, we used to sing this song, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to eat a worm. A big one, fat one, little bitty skinny ones, itchy bitchy fuzzy wuzzy worms. Anybody ever sing that song? And you knew it wasn't true. You knew that if nothing else, your dog loved you or your mother loved you or somebody loved you. But you, it didn't matter what facts, why, this is the way I feel. You know what you got to do? You got to pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. It doesn't matter how you feel. God Almighty loves you. If everybody else hated you, you got to get to where you don't go by feelings. But see, people today have gone past the normal use of feelings. And just because I, I don't feel special, well, then your feelings are wrong. I don't feel like anybody loves me. Your feelings are wrong. I don't feel faith. Your feelings are wrong. You've got the faith of God living on the inside of you. I don't feel like if I lay hands on this person, anything's going to happen. Then your feelings are wrong. Amen. What part of this do you not understand? But see, most people are living by feelings. And God, I just don't feel any. I just don't feel you're with me. I have people come all of the time and say, would you please pray with me? And I say, what for? I just don't feel the love of God. And no, I will not pray with you about that. <laughs> if I agree with you and say, oh God, would you please pour out your love? You know what? That's an insult to God. He says that he's already commended his love towards you. And he never took it back. If you don't feel the love of God, it's your receiver that's broken, not God's giver that's broken. Now... If you would come to me and say, look, I know that God loves me, but for whatever reason, man, I just don't feel the love of God. Would you please pray with me? Whatever's wrong with me? I, oh, yeah, I'll pray with you. I'll lay hands on you for that. I'm glad to do that. But when you come and say, oh, God, would you just please give me joy? When the Bible says you already have love, joy, peace, long-suffering... It's not God's responsibility to give you joy. It's not God's responsibility to give you love or peace. You get peace when you keep your mind stayed upon him. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. It's not through prayer. It's not through begging and fasting and asking God for it. You got to start keeping your mind stayed on God and what he says. And I've just learned to live this way. I don't do it perfectly. But I guarantee I hadn't arrived, but I've left. And to a very large degree, I've been able to bridle my emotions. When my son died and had been dead for nearly five hours, I started to feel the grief, the sorrow that anybody else would have. And I just didn't like it. 
And I said, I don't have to live this way. And I started praising God and thanking God. And when I did, all of the love, joy, and peace that was on the inside began to rise up. And Greg talked about it this morning. This, this is not faith that comes through hearing the word of God. I had a gift of faith rise up on the inside of me. And all of a sudden, I knew that I knew that I knew that somehow that boy was going to live. And after being dead for nearly five hours, sat up and started talking and works for me today and is healthy and whole. And I got a granddaughter that was born the next year, all because I didn't let my emotions dictate and control me. I'm telling you, you always sit there and blame the devil for a lot of stuff. And the truth is that a lot of it is just us. And we are, we are going by how we feel instead of faith. The word of God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And that knowledge gave us these exceeding great and precious promises that through them we might be a partaker of the inheritance, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, through desire, through feelings, through being led by your carnal sight instead of led by faith. Man, that's powerful. The most important thing you will ever do in your entire life is to get to where the Word of God becomes real to you and you start basing your life, your relationship on what God's Word says and not what you feel or see or hear, but you base it on the Word of God. That's what Karis Bible College was created for. And I tell you, we have had thousands of people come who, through here who it just realigns your whole way of thinking and changes things. And for those of you who've decided to be with us, I guarantee you this is going to be the most important decision I think that you've ever made in your life. It's going to transform you. Amen? Amen? Let's have our prayer ministers come up here again. we got a full afternoon, as Sue has already shared, but if anybody needs prayer for anything. We don't want to let a single opportunity to go by. So let these prayer ministers come up here. And if there's anything we can do to help you. Mark, what was the results last night? I think you, how many people got baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, I'm not 100% sure. I think it was around 16. 16 people baptized in the Holy Spirit last night. And we've heard the testimony about Judy. She, uh, where's Judy? Here you are right here. And she had, what, 50, 52 diagnosed problems that she was healed of last night. Had constant pain and totally set free. And anyway, if there's anything that we can do to help you, we want to pray with you. Father, we just thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Father, that you have not left it up to us to perceive these things just through our five senses, what we see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. Father, thank you for the word of God and the truth that it is revealed. And Father, I just thank you that we can base our life on it. Everything that we need comes through the word of God. And I pray that you have people here today make a commitment to put your word, absolute final authority, first and last authority in their life. Romans 3, 4, that they would let God be true and every man a liar, every feeling, every thought a lie that goes contrary to the word of God. Father, we just thank you for it and we thank you that as I've planted these seeds today that they're going to bear fruit, that there will be great things come out of this. So we thank you for it. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you need prayer, come and let somebody pray with you. Do you
prisoners would sing his praise. It would break every chain, break every In the history of Andrew Womack Ministries, this is the most comprehensive product we've ever presented. We have taken all of the revelation that we have collectively and have put it into this product entitled Healing University. We wanted to give this to you in all forms and aspects. It is a teaching and it's an outline, plus then there's question and answers, plus points to ponder, and then dozens of scriptures in each lesson so you can meditate on it. Plus, you're going to see real-life testimonies of people getting healed. So we want to encourage you to check it out and get our Healing University. Want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity? Now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we are broadcasting the gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there, and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the gospel truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much gospel truth radio and download it to your smartphone. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Hell is not for the one who sinned, but for the one who rejected Jesus, period. His sins are not the issue. 
Heaven also doesn't make sense to the natural mind because we think people go there for their good deeds. People go to heaven because they threw themselves on the mercy of God and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. People will be in heaven like the thief with no good works. You say, that doesn't make sense. It's possible to accept Jesus Christ just before you die and you've lived a corrupt life the whole time and you end up going to heaven. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning. Welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. I'm going to be teaching you a one-timer today. This is a great lesson. One I've had back, you know, stuck back there for some time. I thought, I want to pull that thing out and put it on television and just let everybody be greatly blessed by it. It's called Neither Heaven Nor Hell Makes Sense. Now, what I'm talking about is how does the world look at this, all right? We understand grace, but you know what? Grace can sometimes, even to a Christian, it is so incredible. We go, how could that possibly be? It's because your natural mind struggles with the grace of God, and that's what the world does. The Bible says the things that we love, though to the world, even to the educated of the world, this is foolishness to them. They don't even understand it. And God did it just to blow their minds and make it to where the simple one can un, can grab hold of it. And uh, again, this is God's plan for eternity and God's plan for just about everything we have is to operate in grace. Grace is the foundation for how God does it. I like to think of it this way, is that grace is God reaching out to you with a full hand. I mean, in that hand is like it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, Everything pertaining to life and godliness. His hand is full of everything from life and godliness. Life is your natural life and godliness is your spiritual life. Anything you need naturally, anything you need spiritually is all in the hand of the Lord. You need salvation, it's a gift. It's in the hand of grace. That hand is everything that came through the work of the cross. It is your salvation. It's eternal life. It's your healing. It's the meeting of every need in life, your prosperity, all this comes by God's grace. And so grace is God's full hand reaching out to you with, again, everything that pertains to life and godliness. But faith is our empty hand reaching out to God's full hand. Again, faith has no merit to it except for the fact it is simply the only thing we can do without doing anything. Faith reaches out and takes from God's full hand, first of all, salvation, the next of all, growth in the Lord Jesus Christ, the word's been given to us, healing's been given to us, all these things. And so the hand of faith simply reaches out. God is the one that did all the work. God holds it out to us free, and it makes no sense to human beings because in this life, we work for everything we have. We go to the office and we work. We go to the uh, the foundry, the factory, wherever we go and we work. We do all these things again, and then they give us a paycheck. And the Bible points that out, that when you have works, then you have a paycheck. But if you don't have works, you have grace, and simply God has just put it out there without your works. And so, again, this is what God wants for us. But again, the world doesn't understand this. It's foolishness to them to think that heaven, something so magnificent as eternal life, living with God in heaven, could be based on simple grace, then life we just take it. So we have religions around us, all types of religions. And even Christianity mingles some religion in it from time to time. And as we believe we're saved by faith, oh, but by the way, you must come to our church. Oh, but by the way, we add to it, you need to be water baptized. Oh, by the way, we add to it, you need to tithe. All these things are fine and important after salvation, but they do not contribute to salvation. Salvation stands alone on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then he asks us to do these things, not to get eternal life, but because we have eternal life, not to get a relationship with God, but because we have a relationship with God and because God loves us, we want to serve him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so we do, and all the things he wants us to do, to witness and to live a life free from sin. He wants us to shoot that, shoot for that and accomplish it in our life. This is all things we can do according to the word of God. But let's talk about the simplicity of salvation. John chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, of course, familiar verse of scripture. Jesus says here, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much the son of man be lifted up 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, that is the verse of scripture that's almost universally known, but brings out the simplicity of salvation. For again, the simplicity of being born again. It brings it out in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, for by grace, that's God's gift to you. Are you saved through faith? That's your part. Uh, you know, and not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So it's not works that save us. It's grace that saves us. But once we receive it, then we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish good works of this earth because only a Christian can do works that are pleasing to God. Sinners cannot do it, nor can a carnal Christian produce any works pleasing to God, because in that case, you're trying to use your works to get back in favor with God, and your works never got you in favor with God, nor can it bring you back into favor with God. It simply takes the grace of God. And so just as we received uh, salvation, we can receive the forgiveness of sins after we get born again and come back into fellowship with God, that place where the Holy Spirit who lives in us can now empower us. A carnal Christian has the Holy Spirit still living in him. He still has eternal life, but the Holy Spirit doesn't control him. Only a believer in fellowship with God, one who has confessed his whatever sins he's committed, is back to the place now where the indwelling Holy Spirit can be the empowering Holy Spirit, and he lives his life through us. And this is what a spiritual Christian is. And so if you're spiritual, you're not under control of the flesh. If you're carnal, you're not under the control of the Holy Spirit as a, as a Christian. So again, we have it here, but the simple plan of salvation is that we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this is the plan we give to the world. And again, it may stump them because if you ask most sinners, I'm going to say 99 point whatever percent of most sinners, do you believe that if you die, you're going to go to heaven? They'll tell you, yes. You say, why? They completely miss the grace angle. What they'll talk about is their works. Well, I've been a good person. I think when I stand before God, my good works will outweigh my bad works. I think my uh, the things I've done wrong will be far outweighed by what I've done right. This is how God's going to do it. My whole thing is, if that's the way you get to heaven, why did Jesus have to come? Because even your good works can't get you to heaven. It's impossible for you to get to heaven on your own. Even if you never committed a sin in life and all you lived was a good life, a moral life, you still could and go to heaven. Why? Because your righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight. The best you have to offer all the helping ladies across the street, all the fact you've never committed adultery, uh, you've always been faithful to your wife, to your children, you've been a good provider, all those things you might look at are not how you're going to get to heaven. You get to heaven by the grace of God that whether you've been good or bad, you simply receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and that's your, that's your, uh, again, your entrance into heaven. Look at John chapter three while you're there and jump down to verse 36. It says here, he who, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And the word abides is present tense. It means as long as you have not received Jesus, God's wrath abides on you. The way to get rid of that wrath that of God on you is that while you're still alive, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you'll no longer have the wrath of God facing you. You'll no longer go to hell and eventually to the lake of fire, you'll now go to heaven. And that's where Christians go, is they go to heaven and they don't go to hell. This again, in this verse is talking about it. You know, again, it's the Bible says, as far as the world's concerned, this is foolishness. I have witnessed to so many people, especially on airplanes, and just talk to them. When you bring out the plan of God, they just look at you. And I say, that's how simple they say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. I say, well, that's not the point. You know, the point is Jesus did this for you anyway. He asks you to believe it. He asks you to put faith in him. And he made it so simple. The Bible says a fool couldn't err in it. And so he did this because he loves you. He loved you when you were unlovable. God loved you when you were unlovable. Jesus died for you when you were unlovable. And his love was displayed at the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, that's young, old, rich, poor, ugly, good looking. I mean, whatever nation you're from, whatever color you're from, whatever you think of yourself, whatever others think of you, God thinks the world of you. God loves you. No matter how bad you think you are, no matter how despised you think you are, no matter how rejected you think you are, Jesus died for every person because he loves you. Even if there's nothing lovable in you, he chose to love you from himself, not because he found anything in you to love. It's not that you are not the reason he loved you. He is the reason he loved you. Love 
love came from his heart toward you when you were undeserving. And all he says is, if you'll just reach out and take this thing, you can have eternal life. That is what is so amazing about this. And this is what confuses the world. I've sat beside, I mean, one lady I sat beside was a college uh, professor and she was so educated. And, but she, she wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ. And so when I brought this up, she said, well, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in religion. I said, well, guess what? Neither do I. But Jesus was not religious. Jesus actually came against. I told her some of the things Jesus said about religion. And she just looked at me. She had no idea Jesus said these things about them. Whitewashed tombstones. On the outside, you're pretty and white. On the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You always preach out here to the people wonderful things. But behind the scenes, you rip off widows. And uh, you take advantage of them. And you make the people pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. I mean, they got down into the very intricacies of their life. Mint and anise and cumin are spices. Can you imagine going to the grocery store, coming back and measuring out your, you know, your little uh, container there of cinnamon, and you have to give 10% to the church. Can you imagine finding 10% of that cinnamon and all the other ones of spices and all the different things that you have? That's how meticulous they got into. That's how legalistic they got into. Things that were never mentioned in the law, they just kept getting it worse and worse and worse. The Bible said they weren't supposed to work on Saturday. Well, they took everything as work. No matter what you did, you couldn't even live hardly on Saturday. You couldn't even walk across the room. It was considered work. And what it meant was that's not your, you cannot work your occupation on Saturday that you let the fields go, but the work around the house needs to be done and food needs to be prepared. This is what God was talking about. But they got into it. They literally said, you can't take so many steps across the room. They started measuring everything out. And this is again, what religion does to you. It binds you. And yet Jesus Christ came to set us free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So again, John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. I have this series right here. It's called Eight Eternal Foundations. And in it, we get into this doctrine of redemption and how that is all by grace. And everything that's in this thing is about grace and the grace of God. There's, again, redemption, propitiation. Uh, there's uh, glorification. There's eight different teachings in this series. And I want that to become yours. The announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have a copy for yourself. In the meantime, I want to talk to those who, if this is your first time to watch, Glad you're here. Glad you're joining us. It's your second or third time. Glad you're coming back. Something must have hooked you the first time and got you to come back and watch this broadcast. But I want to talk to you too that watch this thing continually and this becomes part of your lifeblood. I realize other ministers will be part of your life, but I'm just glad to be part of them. But on that hand, I simply say this, that you support other ministers. Would you consider supporting this ministry? I'm not asking you to tell you how much to give. That's between you and God. And if the Lord gives you a figure, then you do it. But if he doesn't give you a figure, then you purpose in your heart what you're going to give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Make sure there's cheerfulness attached to that offering you're sending to me. And with it, I can do great things. It's not only God that supplies for this ministry, but he works through you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank for you for being dependable that you give into this ministry. I'm so glad that you're a part of it. Much like the, in the Old Testament where Aaron and her held up the hands of Moses, you helped to hold up my hands. As long as we're working together, we conquer the enemy. I love that. That, uh, you know, if one can put a thousand to flight, that's me too. That's you joining me. Can put 10,000 to flight. My power is multiplied 10 times over with every person that becomes a partner with me in this ministry. Thank you for it. Again, you can go to my website, bobyandin.com. You'll find a place where you can become a partner with me. I thank you in advance. See you right after the break. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often come disguised as complicated or deep sounding words, but the definitions are simple. In this essential series, Bob Yandian breaks down eight foundational doctrines that will bring you strength and stability. The eight doctrines taught in this series are redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, propitiation, election, and glorification. Eight Eternal Foundations is available as an eight CD series for $35 or as an MP3 download for $21. To order, visit BobYandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support 
and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. Welcome back. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 23. I want to take a look at verses 42 and verse 43. In those verses, I want you to take a look with me here at the two thieves that were on the cross besides Jesus. And as he was being crucified, there was a thief on this side, a thief on this side. Both were men. Both were thieves. Both were from the same area. Both probably around the same age, same nationality, all that. Why is that? Because those two thieves represent all mankind. And that's why there was not a woman there and a man there, because if the woman would have accepted, the man wouldn't. Women could claim superiority. If the man accepted, the woman didn't. Men could claim superiority. If one had money, one did not. We could say wealthy people are better. I mean, we could go down the list. That's why when Jesus died, these two thieves on each side of him represented all mankind. You say, why in the world was there two thieves? If the thief represented all mankind, wouldn't one be enough? No, two, because they represent the two answers to the gospel. One said yes, and and one said no. And they both saw the same thing. They both saw Jesus in prison. They both saw him being beaten. They saw him walking down the road carrying that cross. They saw him fall under the weight of it. They saw somebody help him. They saw how that he was bleeding. They saw how he was almost beaten to death. And they saw him nailed to a cross. They heard him say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All the things they saw and heard, and yet one said yes and one said no. In fact, they first, both have all turned against him. When the crowd started yelling at Jesus on the cross, if you're really the son of God, come down from that cross. Well, the two thieves joined in with him, but one of them stopped later and realized, wait a minute, this is the son of God. And he looked at Jesus just before he died and just before Jesus died. The other one did not do this. And so the one who accepted him simply said to him, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus went beyond that and said, listen, I won't just remember you. I'll see you there. He said, I'll see you uh, today in paradise. And he simply meant today, I'll see you in paradise. Let me read the verse to you so we can get it correctly. This is to uh, the, the one good thief, the one that accepted Jesus. The other rejected him. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so he was simply saying, you're going to have, you're going to have eternal life. The other one rejected and died without accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. One went to paradise, one went to hell. And uh, the one that went to paradise was there with Abraham. Those that had died from the Old Testament, he was there with all of them. Jesus eventually went and took those that were in paradise and took them to heaven with the Ephesians chapter uh, 4. That again, he took those and uh, raised them up and took them to heaven with him. He conquered, spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, and then led those people into heaven. So paradise under the earth is empty today. They're all in heaven now because Jesus had to be the first one to enter into heaven, the first fruits, and they got to enter in because of that. And heaven is our final uh, place. We'll go there and that's where we'll eternally be. Hell, on the other hand, much like paradise, paradise was a waiting place to go to heaven. Hell is the waiting place for the lake of fire. And uh, those who go to hell will eventually, after the millennial reign of Jesus is over, which lasts for a thousand years, at the end of that will be the great white throne judgment of which all unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire. And so this is what happened here. And this thief accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Both were thieves. Both, and listen to this, their good works weren't mentioned and their bad works weren't mentioned. They were just called thieves. And thieves here is not just some guy that robs a 7-Eleven on a corner. These guys were part of Murder Incorporated. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan where it said he fell among thieves who beat him and stripped him and left him half dead? They thought he was fully dead. The thieves there were those that waited on the side of the road, and they would look for people that looked like they had anything and just beat them to death and take everything they had. In fact, they were so bad that that literally it cut down on the number of people coming into uh, Rome and into Israel, into Jerusalem, that the, that the soldiers had to start going out and find these people. And these two were probably arrested at the same time and put into prison at the same time, went through trial at the same time, sentenced at the same time, to be executed at the same time, and happened to be right next to Jesus. And again, they represent all of mankind, of which some say yes and some say no. And of course, the one that said yes got to go to paradise. The one that didn't went to hell, awaiting the lake of fire one day. Both were murderers. 
Again, one went to hell, one went to paradise. Their good works were not mentioned in this verse of scripture. Their good works were not even the issue. Their sins were not mentioned. Yet one again went to paradise, one did not. The reason one accepted Jesus and the other did not. Again, the difference between paradise and hell was one thing, not any good works, not anything they had done. It was simply faith in Jesus Christ. That's all it took for one man to go to paradise and one man to end up going to hell. One said yes to Jesus, one said no to Jesus. It simply comes back to you. We're all thieves. Which thief are you, the yes thief or the no thief? If you're the no thief and you're still alive, you have time to change it to become a yes thief and say, yes, Jesus, I accept you as my savior. And you too can go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven forever and forever when you die. If not, and you end up being one that rejects Jesus Christ, there's no place for you to go except for the place where Satan goes and all the fallen angels with him and all the demons with him. And you'll end up going there one day. But the point of it is that that's all it takes to become a Christian. Their good works weren't mentioned. Their bad works weren't mentioned. What if on the cross, Jesus would have said to him, Lord, remember when you come to your kingdom, Jesus said, listen, if you can just get to a church and walk down the aisle and accept me as Savior. That's how you can become a Christian. No, his hands were nailed. His feet were nailed. In essence, that's what he's simply saying about all mankind. Your hands are nailed. Your feet are nailed. You can't get off this cross. There's no good works these hands can do because they're nailed. There's no good place your feet can take you because they, again, are nailed. The only thing you cannot nail to a cross is a person's will and heart. And from the heart, we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. The prayer may not come out of our mouth physically, but we pray and we simply ask the Lord. We tell him, I want to become a Christian. I want to accept you as Lord and Savior. I believe that God raised you from the dead just for me. Romans 10, 9, and 10. This is how we become a Christian. So again, the reason why one went to paradise and one went to hell was because one received Jesus, the other did not. One accepted Jesus, the other did not. Let's talk about this for just a minute. One went to paradise, one went to hell. Now here's the interesting thing. To the natural, even to the educated mind, Christ crucified is foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, the message of salvation is foolishness to the world. It makes no common sense. How in the world can an evil person go to a wonderful place like heaven? And how can a nice moral person possibly go to hell because he's never accepted? The whole guidelines of this whole thing is one thing. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? We would think it's wrong for a convicted murderer to be sent to Florida, live in a condo instead of being put into prison for life and sentenced to capital punishment. What if he lived on a beach in a condo? What if he had the finest of food and all that? And yet this guy's a convicted criminal. We would be crying out for criminal justice in this thing. We need to have punishment for those who have broken the law. Yes, that is true, but God sees it in a different way. He sees it one other way, eternal life. Having Jesus as Lord and Savior, getting to go to heaven comes back to a simple decision because your conviction was poured out on Jesus. What happened and should have happened to you was poured out on Jesus. If you reject Jesus, then it is poured out on you and you as this one thief will go into hell for uh, thousands of years and then one day into the lake of fire for eternity. But if you accept the work that Jesus does, your sentence is remitted as far as God is concerned because Jesus took your punishment for you. Jesus took the guilt for you and Jesus took your verdict and he exchanged it for eternal life. And this is what the one got. So again, it came back to none of their works were mentioned, their good works or their bad works because it had nothing to do with where they were going. The one simple decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It can happen in such a short period of time that five seconds before you die, you can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but don't be stupid and wait that long. Accept him now and have an opportunity to enjoy Jesus Christ for the rest of your life before you ever go to heaven. Again, he wants you to have an abundant life, but that's here on this earth. Why? I'm going to say that again. We would think it wrong for a convicted murderer to be sent to Florida to live in a condo instead of being put into prison for life or sentenced to capital punishment. Prison makes sense because a man goes there for the deeds he has done. This is our view of hell. Yet this is the plan of God for any sinner who would receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and that is the sinner can have eternal life and live in that condo when he dies and goes to heaven. Hell is not for the one who sinned, but for the one who rejected Jesus, period. His sins are not the issue. 
Heaven also doesn't make sense to the natural mind because we think people go there for their good deeds. People go to heaven because they threw themselves on the mercy of God and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. People will be in heaven like the thief with no good works. You say, that doesn't make sense. It's possible to accept Jesus Christ just before you die and you've lived a corrupt life the whole time and you end up going to heaven. It's that convicted murderer living in a condo in Florida on a beach. It makes no sense to the natural mind, but that's because great Grace makes no sense to the natural mind. It is simply received by faith. I accept you, Lord. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And right there, all your sentence is remitted, and you now have eternal life. And if in a few seconds later you go to heaven, you may go there with no good works. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells you you can have no good works, but you end up being there saved as by fire. I mean, in the last minute, you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. People will be in heaven just like the thief with no good works. Heaven and hell will be filled with good people and bad people, moral and immoral people. I'm going to say that again. Moral people and immoral people will be in hell. Moral people and immoral people will be in heaven. But moral and immoral has nothing to do with it. Good works and bad works have nothing to do with it. What does have everything to do with it is the dividing line between the two thieves. One said yes, one said no. That is what eternal life is. So, If a person goes to hell for rejecting Jesus despite his sins, then a person goes to heaven for accepting Jesus despite his sins. If a person goes to hell despite his good works, then a person goes to heaven despite his good works. The transition line between heaven and hell is one thing, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Finally, look with me at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15. Here it says in that verse of scripture, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Those who reject Jesus are not condemned by God, but self-condemned. In other words, you accepted the mercy of God. God, therefore, gives you heaven and has nothing to do with you being worth it or not. You become self-condemned if you don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And in that case, you're thrown into the lake of fire. You're thrown into hell, first of all, prepared for the devil and his angels. God never intended for people. But you know what? If you reject Jesus, there's nothing he can do except send you with the original rejecter, Satan, and the other rejectors, the fallen angels and the demons. And he puts you there because why? You made the same decision as Satan. So therefore, your future has to be where Satan is. But if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your sentence is remitted. You have eternal life. You'll be in heaven forever and forever. What is your choice today? Why not make it? Yes, Jesus, I receive you. I put my faith and trust in you. Therefore, I have eternal life. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God already had determined a purpose for your life, a God-given purpose. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do, and I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis! The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. If you sit under the Word for four hours a day, for five days a week, for two or three years, I guarantee you, you are going to have God speak to you and start revealing purpose to you. Every one of you were created for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose is?
listener-supported, Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Karen Conrad serves as Vice President of Wealth Builders. She is a consultant, teacher, author, and maintains a successful real estate and home staging business that has been featured on the Lifetime Television Network. Welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. Hi, and welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. This is our final day of a new series that I've rolled out this week called The Process for Success. So this has been really fun. We started out with purpose and I was sharing a lot of the revelation I'd received over the past couple of weeks. It's amazing. The word just keeps going deeper and deeper. We talked a lot about vision and we are or system for you to work with for your children or if you're a grandparent for your grandchildren. Imagine if we took the time to put our children's ideas and grandchildren's dreams and ideas into a system that they were able to learn at an early age how to build a business plan and see their vision become reality. If you do it in little things, then as they grow, they will be able to do it in big things, which you know God has such a plan for each and every one of our children and grandchildren. Or if you're someone that you've always dreamed about doing a business and never step forward, today's the day. It's time. So we're in the midst of talking about the business model canvas. Now, if you've missed the programs, uh, I really encourage you to go to my website and you can purchase this product, Process for Success. Go to karenconrad.net, go to the store, And you can click on this and you'll get in one package a DVD and an MP3 CD. Um, So we talked about customer segments, customer relationships, and channels. Uh, Now I'm going to talk to you about revenue streams. So revenue streams are extremely important for you to define. So if you remember, I was using the example of a coaching system. So a revenue stream um, could be uh, like a, a training, like maybe... A revenue stream would be that we go in and we train the the coaches and we train the um, students or the children on the system. That could be one revenue stream. Another revenue stream might be that they purchase the product or maybe they purchase a monthly subscription. So you're getting the idea because we have to look at what all of the the revenue options we have. A lot of times you might have one business. Um, and it might have one purpose, but it might have multiple revenue streams. Let me just give you another example on this that you can relate to, to get your mind really expanded here. So with my home staging, I have multiple revenue streams. I have one home staging business and everything flows from me physically going and staging homes. But let's think about this. I did the before and afters. So every house that I staged, I collected the before and afters. I documented what I did. I wrote down blogs of the stories and that turned into a book. All right. So I've got the revenue stream that I would go and actually stage a home. Then because I documented it and I had a friend that helped me pull the book together, a book was created. So now I sell that book and that's a revenue stream. I take what I learned to create that book and I reformatted it to fit the state of Colorado requirements for um, continuing education. So I formed that, just did an adjustment. I submitted that to, to what we call DORA. I got approval for the class of three credit and a six credit. And I put on an all day conference where people came in and they learned how to stage homes So the furniture that I had built with my business, I brought in the documentation that I did and took when I staged the home that turned into a book, I now made into a training. And now I have a revenue stream that I can put on conferences and I made an online course. So I get a check every month there. I can consult. So I have people that want, they want to do the staging themselves, or maybe someone wants to learn how to stage. So I charge a consulting fee and I go out and I let them know what to do. I can rent my furniture to other stagers. Do you see that? It all came out of one business process of staging homes. 
but I've turned it into multiple revenue streams. I'm telling you everything you do, if you really think about it, you will be able to come up with multiple revenue streams. Um, then we've got the activities. What are the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the things that we have to do to fulfill and do the things that are called for in the business plan and in, in the business model canvas? Um, we've got resources. What resources are going to be required for me to actually do what it is that I said I want to do? So let me give you an example. If I wanted to write a book, okay, I need to find a publisher or I need to find a resource of someone that can pull the information together to develop the book. I need the resource of a graphic designer. If we're talking about me staging homes, I need a mover, right? because I need someone that actually brings that furniture. So that's the resources part. And then costs, you need to define the costs. Um, so many businesses, they fail in the first two to three years, a lot of times because they haven't count the cost or at least properly measured it, and they end up running out of funds, or they decide that they just don't want to keep pouring money into it. So be realistic what your costs are, and it helps you. Don't dive into You don't need to do everything at once. Maybe there's some things you can do without or make do with so that you manage the, the cost so that you can allow your business to take off and grow. And then partners. Who are the key people that I'm going to rely on that are going to help me to get this done? For example, a key partner for my book would be uh, Amazon, right? So that my book's on Amazon. Um, a key partner for me with my blog is going to be my website provider. Uh, so it just helps define those things. The value proposition is right in the middle of the canvas. Um, now I went on the outside in, but I will tell you that if you are doing this exercise and you use the tool that I was showing you, you want to start with your value proposition. So this is how you build a value proposition. And I give Billy Epperhart credit for this. This is what he is insistent we use. And it's such a good template. It goes like this. We provide blank. Okay. So what's that product or service that you provide to whom, who is your target market? So you fill in your target market. Unlike blank, your nearest competition. Now this is for you internally. You're not going to announce externally through a marketing campaign who your competition is, but it's important for you to understand your competition, but also to set yourself apart. Okay. So unlike blank, who's your nearest competition, we offer blank. Okay. Product or service at what price? So it might be something that says, um, we offer, let's just say I'm a restaurant. Uh, unlike McDonald's, okay, we offer healthy um, food, let's just say organic food, healthy organic food at a reasonable price. So this is great. And I'm telling you, if you're walking, working with your kids or grandchildren, they will love this and you can brainstorm with them to fill out the blank and it really guides you. Uh, so I just provided the value proposition example in my teaching. Um, so that was step four. Okay, so that is the business model canvas. And I gave you just about this much of a teaching that's this big. And so if you want to learn more about that, um, I think you could go to, uh, you could probably get it through Karis Bible College. Uh, or um, you actually could Google. There's a lot of information on this online. Uh, or come to Karis Business Summit. We usually teach on this and we do workshops on it. Or you could even just call for some mentoring or coaching or email me. And we have this as part of the strategic uh, business plan process. We build those with you. And this is a key element. All right. So that was step four. Step five, setting benchmarks. Setting benchmarks. You want to measure your success. That's why benchmarks are really important. Because how do you know what you're going to celebrate if you haven't set a benchmark? then you don't know. How do you know you've hit your target unless you've actually aimed and know where you're headed with your target? I encourage you to get your net out. I explain, I will explain more on that and then make those benchmarks realistic, but a stretch. It's important that we allow God to stretch us. Um, 
So I just have a little quote here too that I want to share with you. It says, go, go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you have imagined. All right. So that's great. Go confidently in that direction. I'll tell you this system will give you the steps that will give you the confidence that you will see those dreams become a reality. All right. So get your net out. What is God showing you to go for and achieve? Bring God into this. Have him help you set these benchmarks. What are the problems that you want to solve? Define those and put a number or something that you can quantify by that. What do you want to achieve in your ministry and or business? And what would it take to make that happen? Again, go back to the measurable benchmark. I tell you to make them realistic, but a stretch. And a lot of that is because you have to give the Holy Spirit some room to Get in there and, and uh, you know, you've got a huge advantage. It is not fair. We have an incredible advantage with the Holy Spirit living in us. Um, here's some questions that you that I want to ask you when you set your benchmarks. First of all, don't just throw some numbers out there. Are you committed to reaching the benchmarks? Because if you're not committed, you will not do the steps necessary to achieve them. But if you are committed Put that number down there and you can work to develop the steps to achieve it. Do the benchmark support the vision? This is critical, especially if you're in a little bit of a larger organization or in an entrepreneurial organization where you have to rely on people maybe that are um, part time. Maybe they're people that are um, people you hire, you know, they're contract people. They have to know everybody needs to know your vision. And your benchmarks need to support that so that you do not waste time. And will they cause you to have to stretch and rely on God? Now, one of the important things about setting benchmarks is measuring success. If you want growth, do you have the systems and infrastructure to support it ongoing? So um, the example that I've used, you maybe heard me say this before, is uh, like I'll get in a room with ministers and maybe they have 50 people going to their church and I'll say, What's your benchmark for next year? What do you want to achieve? And they'll say, I want a thousand people attending church by the end of December. And this is my question. So if God blessed you and brought in, or we did this marketing plan and God blessed that marketing plan to bring in a thousand people to go to your church, do you have room for them? And the answer is like, oh, no. Okay, well, if you don't have room for them, we need to either figure out how to increase your space or you it's not realistic to put a thousand people as your benchmark. Do you know, we dream big sometimes, but we don't always think about the things required. If we actually hit that, if God actually blessed us with it, what would happen? Um, if you don't have the infrastructure, uh, like even I guess I'm thinking about churches right now. If you don't have the volunteers that can greet the people coming in, your infrastructure is going to break. If you don't have an accounting process that can handle 500 envelopes on a Sunday, your infrastructure is not ready with the growth. So you need to think ahead to the infrastructure and build into that. So when God brings that growth, when God blesses you with that thousand people, that you actually have systems in place that's going to give them a good experience. If you do not have the ability to hire more help, and I hear this a lot with entrepreneurs, Ask yourself what, what will help you be more efficient or other ways to take on more to reach these benchmarks. Okay. So, um, sometimes what we do, like I'll just tell in myself again, I'm really good at that. So right now I have kind of hung on to a lot of the administrative things. And so I have goals and visions for the ministry, but right now I'm doing like five tasks. Okay. So let's just say I got a thousand partners. I would not be able to handle it. So my net isn't out. My infrastructure is not in place. So if I have a goal or a benchmark of having a thousand ministry partners by the end of December, it would implode. Okay. So those are the things I'm just saying we have to be prepared for. If you're serious that you want a thousand partners by the end of the year, you need to build systems and get people in place. So when people begin to bless you with that partnership, that you are, you're stewarding them, that you're getting a thank you note out to them, 
that you're able to call and pray for people. Do you know those types of things? I think you understand what I'm saying, but it's really, really important. Otherwise, it's kind of pie in the sky and we end up not achieving it because we haven't measured the cost or the infrastructure requirements to make it happen. And then prepare your team to take on more. So um, this is pretty typical in companies, but sometimes uh, staff will just say, we're so overloaded, uh, we can't take on any more, okay? But they can talk an hour in the hallway, right? So begin to prepare your team that we need to tighten things up a little bit because I can't hire another person and I'm going to need you to take on more and help me to achieve this God-given vision. So uh, do your benchmarks bring you closer to achieving your vision? These are some questions that you need to answer when you're going through the process of setting your goals and benchmarks. It has to hit supporting your vision. Otherwise, you will... Um, you will not have the scripture to back up the Lord's purposes. You will get weary. You'll give up. And pretty soon the work that you put into it kind of falls to the wayside. And then make them measurable and challenging enough with those benchmarks that you have to rely on God. Okay, step six is developing strategies. Strategies are how you are going to achieve those benchmarks. And so um, it can be kind of broad, like what are we willing to do and what are we not willing to do to be able to attain these goals? For example, if I am a real estate agent and I want to do $5 million this year, what strategies am I going to use to achieve it? Maybe it's open houses. Maybe open houses is going to be my strategy. And so... To use that strategy, I'm going to work on as many open houses as possible because I believe that that will help me attain the vision and the benchmark of not only blessing people in real estate, but doing $5 million this year. Do you see how that works? Another strategy in real estate might be, um, you know, if I get a listing to knock door to door and ask people if they have friends or family that would like to move into the neighborhood. Personally, that's not something I'd be willing to do. So someone might bring that up or I might say, here's a strategy. You could knock door to door. But I would say, you know what? I'm not willing to do that. So that is not, while it's a strategy, that is not a strategy that I am or this organization is willing to do. So there's, you have to line it up with who you are. Look for opportunities and what you have available. Andrew teaches a teaching called What's in Your Hand. You know, he's actually brought us through that exercise like three times. What do you have in your possession that you could use to multiply and establish strategies? What I described to you with home staging is a great one. If I want more revenue out of my home staging business, I can only stage so many homes, right? But if I have a strategy of creating additional revenue streams through teaching, right? That is a strategy for me to not only reach real estate agents, but create another revenue stream. And then do the strategies bless people and further ministry or business. Now, your strategies are extremely important because they drive your marketing action plans and your project teams. They're a very crucial part of what you do. This is a critical step to implementing change. So this is my question for you. What are you doing today that you can maximize or add a strategy to? You may feel that you are stuck in your business or that you're capped. And I will tell you, when you start thinking about strategy and some of the ways that you can deliver to your vision, you will come up with multiple ways and start to realize that you're probably not stuck at all. All you need to do is think about what strategies you can do to create more revenue streams that points up to the vision. And I assure you, every business has multiple revenue streams. So do the strategies bless people and further business and or ministry? It is all about being a blessing. You know, we are here to show people Jesus. We're here to bless each other. And remember that scripture I read that when God gives us gifts and talents, he says to employ it in serving one another. So if I own a restaurant, what's going to drive me is that when people come in there, that they feel the love of God and they enjoy a beautiful meal that will allow them to connect in their relationship. Okay, that would be a great vision. 
in that process, I need to think about what I can do to be a blessing to my customers that helps achieve that vision. So it might be something like, I'm going to remember their names. That's a strategy. We are going to be a restaurant where we remember people's names. And the way we do that is we might write down a, you know, a name they came in this night, describe, um, maybe take a picture. I don't know if you can do that. But I'll tell you, there's a restaurant that we go to. We go to it quite a bit. It's a very nice restaurant. But we weren't there for maybe a couple months. And we walked in. Levi and I went to a table. And the waiter was like, well, hello, Mrs. Conrad. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I feel like a million bucks. That guy just remembered who I was. That is a strategy to create, the, to, to um, reach the vision of that restaurant. Do you see how that works? Uh, what are the top needs of the people affected by the strategy? So if you're thinking about how to, to strategize the strategies to achieve your benchmarks and vision, one of the things is to look at the needs of the people that fit that criteria. What are the needs of the people you're trying to meet through your vision? And that will develop a strategy kind of from the side. Do you see that? And then it makes it easy to hear direction when our focus stays on him. You know, strategies are fun to come up with. Some people, it might seem like a foreign language, but when you bring in God and you ask him to help you, we're going to stay focused on you and help give us ideas on how to reach the people you want us to reach. The ideas will flow. Establishing strategies or recap for you. This is how you're going to approach achieving your benchmarks, which supports your vision. And you'll decide what you will and will not do to achieve your defined success. All right. Step seven, strategic action plans. Strategic action plans lead to project teams. It's how you take strategies and convert them to practical implementation. Project teams, and Dean Racky teaches this, help you achieve vision. You don't need to take on everything at the highest level. A matter of fact, don't do that because you'll start to attract better workers when you give them autonomy and you empower them to come up with ways to achieve the strategy, the benchmarks, and the vision. Create cross-department teams when possible. This was something that I've always done. When I am working on a project and it involves um, getting input from teams, I really like to pull people from teams that might not have anything to do with my project because they think different than I do. It strengthens teamwork and it helps people to feel that they're all contributing to a single vision. Brainstorming your teams on what programs you will implement within your strategies to bring the results that you desire. You could have multiple action plans under each strategy. So let me give you an example. If I have a strategy, like I mentioned with real estate, that I'm going to teach real estate, okay, I'm going to, or home staging, I'm going to teach home staging to real estate agents. Um, if I want to have a breakdown of what that's going to take. So I can't just decide all at once, like, you know what? I'm going to go teach at Dora tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. If I say I've got a strategy that I'm going to teach home staging at Dora for real estate agents, I need to start listing under there all the things that I need to do to make sure that when I have an invitation to teach that, that I'm ready. So it's things like create a PowerPoint. It's things like uh, get approved, fill out your application with Dora. Uh, it's like do a check-in, you know, sheet, all those things. Those are strategic action plans that go underneath a strategy that document all the things that you need to do to, to get that strategy to be successful. You can have multiple action plans. And in most cases, you are going to have multiple steps and multiple ways to actually contribute to that strategy. So get your team involved. And when we're talking about strategic action plans, this is where the rubber meets the road is what I say. All at once, you are moving with action. If you think about it, up to this point, all we did is kind of talk conceptually about what we were doing. We did the vision, you know, all the things that lead to it. But this is where you actually start doing the steps that are necessary to bring the result. 
Okay, step eight is called the creative process. Um, there's something that we're showing you on the screen right now that is called a creative process document. This is very simple, but honestly, this is one of the key ways for you to get your messaging pulled together with your team. It provides direction to your writers, graphic artists, digital marketers, media, and more. It clarifies your message, your target audience. It provides a visual direction, clarifies motivators, and gives you the elevator pitch words. It's a critical part of bringing your vision to reality. So when we're looking at this template, we start on top and we have our age range, our income, um, our geographic motivators, what's causing people, what's motivating people or will motivate them. What are they looking for that will cause them to take action? Then we identify the target audience need. We identify the solution regardless of the offering. Um, and then we talk about how does this offering satisfy the solution and how does the audience's life improve from our offering? Isn't that key? Because everything we do blesses people and that your team comes together with a message box. Step nine, our final step in this process is called a sign follow up. I have a quote here that says a goal without a plan is just a wish. So you want to take the first steps in a sign follow-up so that when you leave a meeting, everybody knows what tasks they are going to do that will contribute to you achieving the benchmark and the vision. Schedule a meeting within a week to follow up and ensure that follow through is done. So here's what you do. Determine what has to be done to get things moving. Document that and assign a name and a date to ensure that you have follow through. Schedule a meeting where you go through in front of everybody. You have the whole group in there and you go line item by line item. And guess what? I don't want you to talk about my line item that was assigned to me and do and it not be done, right? So there's people like it will motivate people to get the plan done. Um, one of the things I used to laugh about is, is when I was in banking and we had a, we had a really good project manager. And she's like, okay, we're going to meet on this project at two o'clock on Tuesday. Boy, I tell you what, at about noon on Tuesday, everybody on that team was clicking away because they wanted to make sure that they got their task done before going into a group setting to go step by step. So this way people know you're serious and your team gets involved with helping you achieve the vision. So in conclusion, you can use this system as broad or concise as you want. The next step after this is actually a marketing plan and followed by what I call the results reporting. I believe that if you take these steps, you document them and you follow what I said, uh, I think that you will be well on your way to having a process for success. So thank you again so much for joining me this week with the new series, Process for Success. God bless you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining me this week for my new series called Process for Success. If this has been a blessing to you and you want this product, you want to listen to it or watch it, go to karenconrad.net, go to the store and you can purchase it and you'll get a DVD and an MP3 CD. Also, if my program is a blessing to you, please consider partnering with me. Ask God if that's something that he would have you do. And if so, go to karenconrad.net. I'll tell you what, my partners bless me so much. And so if you're already a partner, Thank you so much for your support. You mean more to me than what you realize. God bless you and make it a great day. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. I, that wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories you won't hear anywhere else. I wanted to make a difference, not just a living. I didn't want to settle for anything less than God's plan for my life. Harris Online was my next step to living a life of purpose. Discover what God has for you with online courses from Karis Bible College.
and live the life you were born to live. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. God likes faith because faith makes it fair. On the next Good News program. The program you're about to watch is part of a free series we are making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries, entitled God Likes Faith. In this series, you'll learn that God has no favorites, and by faith, everyone has equal access to every blessing. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We are into our series entitled God Likes Faith. And when you understand how faith works and the principles of faith, you're going to like it too. And if you already have practiced these things, this will be a refresher course. And I have studied faith for many, many decades. But I have to tell you, the last three months as I've prepared for these teachings, I have been just excited, thrilled, it's just like, uh, you know, it's like visiting an old friend. And it's so, uh, it's so exciting to bring these truths to you, especially in the times in which we live. We need to walk by faith like never before. And faith just simply sets you free from circumstances. And as circumstances get worse and worse and more and more unstable and unpredictable, faith remains the same. God's promises do not change. The good news does not change. The bad news doesn't cancel out the good news. <laughs> bad reports cannot cancel out the promises of God, the promises that God has made you. And faith builds on those promises. So this is the way that God wants us to live. We told you that God likes faith because He's a faith God. I gave you plenty of examples of that. And if you'd like to go back and get the teaching and see where we've been, get our study notes. They're absolutely free. You can go to the website and you can download them immediately and have them even for this program. Or go to our helpline and say, hey, mail the study notes to me. We'll mail them out free of charge. Uh, we'd love to get the study notes in your hands and you can follow along with the rest of this teaching. Uh, and then have it to refer back to. But God likes faith in, in, this, uh, in this program. I'd like to elaborate on this point. God likes faith because faith makes it fair. And you're going to really appreciate this principle, I think. Uh, the, the, most, uh, the place in, in the world today that's the most fair or equal is in the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. Everybody has equal access to everything God has in God's kingdom by faith. And, and uh, you know, there's a scripture that I like to read in this, in this context. It's Mark chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. And that's a key right there. If you want to receive more from God, you need to hear more. And, and you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If, you don't, if you're not happy with what you've been given, maybe you need to change what you've been hearing. <laughs> you need to hear the right things because to those who hear, more will be given. But notice verse 25. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, I said faith makes it fair. This really doesn't sound fair, does it? This sounds unfair. But in fact, it is fair if you understand the system. He says that, it, that you, can, you can hear more and receive more. And then he says there will be some who will just continue to receive, continue to be blessed, continue to get. And there will be others that will lose what they had. Now, you know, if, if we were communists, we'd say, now that isn't fair. What we need to do is take away from the rich and give to the poor and spread it out all equally. Make sure everybody gets a little bit. 
And, but that's not the kingdom of God. And one of the reasons it's not is because in God's kingdom, he has unlimited amounts of wealth. So there's no need to ration it. There's no need to, 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 to try to make it, you know, spread out equally and make it last. There's no need because there's plenty for all of eternity. So we're dealing with unlimited wealth for one thing. But, but here's, here's how this really works. And that is this. Those who learn how to receive by faith will just continue to receive. Those who don't will have a very difficult time holding on to what they have because they'll be robbed through unbelief or wrong thinking or attacks of the enemy. You know, the faith, faith in the armor of God is represented as the shield. That allows you to keep what you have. The shield is the defensive weapon that allows you to hold on to the things you have and stop all the attacks of the enemy. If we could go back to our illustration of the buffet, and I made this on a few of our... our